Kia ora, hello and welcome to the ASP.NET Core 3 with C Sharp getting started for Komunda Cloud. I'm your host, my name is Josh Wolf. I am a developer advocate at Komunda and I have no idea what I'm doing. So that makes two of us, so let's just do this together. Now I'm going to be using a set of instructions that I wrote that you'll be able to find in the Komunda Cloud getting started documentation. I've got them right here. You're going to need a couple of things on your machine to be able to go through this getting started guide. You're going to need .NET installed and configured, and you're going to need some kind of IDE. You could use Visual Studio Code, or like me, you could use IntelliJ Writer. That's what I'm going to be using. We're also going to need the ZB Modeler, but we'll grab that a little bit later. So let's get started. First thing we're going to do is we're going to scaffold a new web API project. So I'm doing it in my scratch directory. Yep, .NET new web API minus O cloud starter. That's the name of our project here. So it's created the project. It's restoring some packages. Um, now we're going to install the ZB C Sharp client from NuGet. So let's go into the project directory to start with. And at the time that I wrote this, the ZB client C Sharp uh, package in NuGet is version 0.16.1. It might have gone up, you can check NuGet, but it definitely works with this version. So we're going to install that into the project. Now we're going to be using a logging library called nlog. You don't have to use that with Commander Cloud, but nlog is the logging library used in the C Sharp client. It's recommended by the author Christopher Zeldin, so I just uh, you know, added it to my project and I quite like it. It's kind of cool. So we're going to add three packages for that. We're going to add nlog, we're going to add the nlog schema package, and we're going to add the nlog web asp net core package. Those are the three packages that we need to do our thing. Okay, next we're going to create this file called nlog.config in the project. So to do that, I'm going to open my IDE writer, and it's going to open it in this directory. It's going to ask me if I want to open it as a solution or a directory. I'm going to say a solution so that it can load all of the kind of IntelliSense and, you know, helpful kind of stuff like that. Okay. Here we go. It's loading and it's going to load the project and then kind of lay it all out here. So while it's doing that, I'm going to go back to the instructions and copy the actual code snippet that we're going to add in there. It's XML configuration for the nlog library go back to writer and we need to create a new file in here so we're going to say add let's try that again add a file and we're going to call it nlog.config like this okay and then we'll just paste that code sample in there 80 percent of programming is knowing which code sample to copy and paste we're going to get rid of these files that we don't need here uh, from the scaffolding, so refactor the safe delete. Goodbye. We don't need this weather forecasting thing. It's part of the demo kind of project. Yep, take all the stuff out. And there's a controller in here that we don't need, so uh, refactor the safe delete. Goodbye. Cool. Okay, so we got our analog.config here, and if I have a look in uh, the cloud starter CS proj file, which is kind of like my um, you know, build sort of a project, overall project thing. It's got this item group in here, so it's going to copy the analog.config file into the build so that at runtime, you know, the, the program will have access to it. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to edit program.cs, the main kind of program file here, and we're basically going to rip out everything here, and we're going to add in this code here, which injects the nlogger, bam injects nlogger as our logging library for this ASP.NET Core project. Import the missing references, ready to roll. All right, that's all we need to do for that. Let's, um, let's actually just run the program to make sure that it can compile at this point. .NET watch run. You can use .NET run. I like to use .NET watch run because it just, you know, whenever I update the source code, it will recompile it and then restart it. It saves me from that problem where you're like, how come my changes are not being, um, my changes are not being updated. Okay, so here's a little problem here. The name of the file is different. Not a problem. Save that. It's going to restart. Let me edit these instructions right now because otherwise I might forget and we wouldn't want you to have to deal with this problem when you're following the guide. So we'll get rid of that and then we can just go down and I'll commit the changes directly. Yeah. 
All right. Okay, that's working good. Good. Next stage, we're going to create a cluster in Kamunda Cloud. To do that, we're going to go to kamunda.io. Uh, now, if you don't already have a Kamunda Cloud account, you can get one for free for the beta program. You can get a Kamunda Cloud cluster, a ZB cluster in Kamunda Cloud. And if you already have an account, you know, you can log in. And if you're like me, you're already logged in. So it'll just drop me straight into the Kamunda Cloud dashboard where I'm going to create a new ZB cluster. So I'm going to click on create new cluster, ZB cluster name, could be anything, but I'm going to call it ASP.NET dash starter, no spaces. So we've got to use like a separator character, development free beta ZB0234, current version at the time I made this add. Seconds later, it appears magically in my dashboard, but it is in the creating state. So it has a red dot here, not available yet. It's being provisioned into Europe West One, which is a Google data center in Belgium. So while that's baking in the oven, we can actually click on it because there is another step that we can do before it gets provisioned, and that is to create the client connection credentials. So I go into my overview of the cluster and then I click on clients. Now this is kind of like an API key for your program to be able to authenticate and authorize uh, commands against the cluster. Now the name of the client can be anything that you like. It's a human readable name for your own reference so that in your dashboard you know which client uh, connection credentials belong to which programs or whatever. So you've got client ID here and then you've got a client secret which you can't see but you can copy and you also have this handy connection information block with all the configuration stuff that you need. So we're going to come back and grab that a little bit later. But what we're going to do now is we are going to add a package to our program called .NET env. No, .env.net. .env.net. .NET add package .env.net. And what this package does is it enables us to put the connection credentials into like an environment variable file and just read them out of there so we can 12 factor our application. Um, okay, so what we're going to do to do that is I'm going to open another terminal here and I'm just going to copy and paste that in here. Boom. Magically just works. Then we're going to edit the startup.cs file and we're going to add the service in here. So this is the service for the environment variable reader. So startup.cs in configure services here. Let's uh, drop it in like that. There we go. Uh, 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 and then import missing references to the file. There we go. Beautiful. Now you notice here that we're adding an end file called commundacloud.env. So I'm going to go ahead and create that file now. Add file. And it's called commundacloud.env. Cool. Then I'm going to open the file. I uh, just open it as plain text. And then we're going to go into here and we're going to copy the client connection credentials that we created in an earlier step. Paste them in. Now, here we've got to delete these uh, exports. Wish I knew multiple select shortcut in Writer. Get rid of these things. And then save that. Um, we'll ignore that extension for now. Okay, cool. Great. Now we need to make sure that we copy this uh, commundacloud.env file into the build so that it's available to the program at runtime. So we're going to go edit cloudstarter.cs proj. Now, mm -mm -mm. yeah, okay. We're going to create an item group entry in here for this thing. Uh, here it is, 80% of programming, copying and pasting the correct code sample from Stack Overflow or from the readme. Good, let's go back to this local thing here. It's restarting my program, cool. Okay, now we're gonna create this uh, service, the ZB service file. So if I go here and add a new file, yeah, file. And then I paste that name in, services slash zbservice.cs, bam. Okay, now I'm gonna copy and paste this entire content and then I will walk you through it. So we'll copy that and then we just paste that right here, save that, and then we choose, we choose life. Um, come now, here we go, import missing references and file. All done, save that and that should make my build task happy down here. Let's go for a little walkthrough uh, the property. 
Okay, so we got our imports, of course, and then what we do here at the top inside Cloud Starter Services namespace, we create an interface for the, the IZB service. Now that defines this uh, service for the dependency injection container and helps us with like IntelSense and the rest of the project. And here's the actual implementation of the ZB service itself. We've got a couple of private fields here. We've got a ZB client and we have a logger, which is going to be our end logger. It's going to get injected in here. Now in the constructor, we're going to inject in this .env.net environment reading uh, service, and we're going to also inject in the end logger service. So we grab a reference to the logger, and here's where we use this .env.net environment reader to get these string values from that file. You know, this enables us, you, you would add this file to your like .gitignore file so that it doesn't get checked into source control. And then at runtime, you know, maybe in your build system or um, in your deployment system, you'd provide it through, I don't know, you know, Docker Compose or, or even just an environment file that you mount into a Docker image. That would be another way you'd do that. Uh, back to the service. So you have to do a little bit of manipulation here of the of these environment variables that you get from the Komunda Cloud console. And you know I've just done it here, a pretty ghetto way of doing it to get the correct audience for the OAuth2 token that we're going to get back. And then what we do here is we create a ZB client using the builder pattern, and we you know configure the Komunda Cloud token kind of uh, stuff that we need to do build. And then we've got a reference to the client. Now here's one thing that might be a bug that's fixed by the time you get to this, but if you've ever run a C-sharp application against any Komunda Cloud cluster, if you try to run another application against another cluster, it blows up, doesn't work. So to get around that, I've opened a bug for it, hopefully it'll be fixed very soon, but you've got to delete this file, .zb forward slash cloud.token, it's in my home directory, I'm not sure where it'll be on Windows. You'll have to go hunting for it. But on Linux and OS X, you can just do tilde forward slash dot ZV forward slash cloud dot token. I delete that token. Uh, that's going to enable the retrieval and storing of this OAuth2 token for this cluster. Okay, cool. Uh, now we're going to test the connection. So for our application here, our UI, our interaction through it is going to be over REST, um, you know, through like just in the browser getting a route. So we need to create a controller, right? So if we go into controllers, add a new controller, and we'll call it ZB Controller. Very, um, a very original name. Descriptive. 80% of programming is debugging. 50, no, 80% of programming is knowing the correct code sample to copy and paste from Stack Overflow. 50% of programming is debugging, and the other 20% is correctly naming your entities. Uh, okay, so let's grab all of this nice good stuff that constitutes the internal code for this controller and then just bam, paste it in there. Let's import the missing references and then here we go. Um, if I'm going too fast for you, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go ahead and set it to run at a slower speed. Um, okay, cool. So let me walk you through this. So we have a private field here, ZB service, and we use the dependency injection container to inject a reference to the ZB service here, and then we capture that for our own use elsewhere, and then we create one single route. It's a get route, it's on the status in, uh, status route, and what it does is it just awaits the outcome of that ZB service status call, which reaches out to the cluster and gets the topology. Once we get that back, we then convert it to a string. So you can see you know, where we do that down here. In the ZB service, we have this one service that we expose called status. We send a topology request to the cluster. Send, and it's a task. It's asynchronous. A lot of the stuff is going to be async because we're operating over the network, of course. Now, you might notice that my build task is blown up because the dependency injection service container can't find the, the ZB service. We need to instantiate uh, an instance of that service. So if we go into startup and have a look in here, you can see we've got our services here where we've configured them, but we need to create a ZB service in there. So we're going to add a singleton of the ZB service. Uh, let's do it right here like that. Let's import these missing references, bam, and save that. And then this should all start up and like magic, it should all just work magic. Okay, uh, I'm gonna open this thing here. Now we don't have a default um, view or, or route, so now if I call for the status endpoint, 
like magic, it all just works. Amazing, hey? On the first go. This is about the 10th time I've shot this video. <laughs> but this time it just worked. Um, okay, gateway version here, 0234. Uh, and then, you know, some metadata, data about the broker. This particular address here is internal to the Kubernetes infrastructure. So not really much that you're going to be doing with that. Really not really much that you're going to do with this at all. But it does demonstrate that the cluster is running and that we can communicate with it. So we know that the cluster is running. We know we have the correct configuration uh, values for our client connection credential. It's all working really well. Great. So now we're going to create a model that we can deploy into the broker uh, cluster. Now to do that, we're going to use the ZB Modeler. You can follow this link here. It'll take you to the ZB Modeler releases page on GitHub. And at the time that I made this video, the current version is 0.9.1. And you can see here we got like our Linux, Mac, and two flavors of Windows, 32 and 64-bit. Now I happen to have this already downloaded on my machine. So I'm going to just go ahead and start it up. There it is. All right, it's an Electron uh, application. Um, we're going to create a new BPMN diagram. Let me put that in the center and then embiggen this so that you can see it. Cool. Now, imaginatively, we're going to call our start event start. We're going to create a single service task and then an end event, which we will also very imaginatively call end, correctly naming entities, 20% of programming. Now, this service task in the middle here, click on it. Choose this little icon here, which is a spanner or a wrench, depending on where you're from. Change it to a service task. Now we're going to call this service task get time like that. And then I'm going to open the properties panel. And I'm sorry, but I can't make the properties panel any bigger. I haven't figured out how to do that. But in here, details type is going to be get dash time. All lowercase, no spaces. Get dash time. So get hyphen time. Um, good. Now I'm going to click on the blank space in the process diagram, and that gives me the, pro the properties for the overall process. Now in here, I'm going to give it an ID, and I'm going to call it test-process, test-process, all lowercase, no spaces. And I'm going to name it human-readable name, test process. And from here, I just need to save this. Now to save this, we're going to save it into the project, which I have in workspace, Commander scratch, 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 uh, scratch, and cloud starter. And we're going to create a new folder in here called resources. And we're going to save it into the resources folder. And I'm going to call this process file test dash process. I usually name my model files, my BPMN files, with the same file name as the process ID. It makes them easier to find, save. Okay, back to the project. So in here, we now have our resources folder, which has the test process.bpmn file in it. And so we need to copy that process model into the build. So we go in here again to edit edit the CS, the cloudstarter.cs proj file, and then basically, I'm going to copy this, this is easy, uh, but you can copy it from, from the readme, and then I'm just going to copy everything in the resources folder, resources forward slash double asterisk, like that. Now, that's going to restart my project. Okay, we got a model, we've got it in the, in the, the project, it's copying it into the build, now we're going to deploy it into the cluster. So to do that, we're going to go into the ZB service. We're going to create a new method called deploy. Let's go back to my readme. And in here, we're going to have to do two things, modify the interface and implement the method, right? So let's modify the interface first of all. And writer. OK, so we go up to the interface definition at the top. And then we're going to add another method, which was paste in there like that. Save. Got an error here because it doesn't correctly implement the interface, but that's okay. We're about to fix that. So in, uh, okay, grab this method here, 80% of programming, knowing what to copy and paste. I'll paste that there, save that, and then import the missing references in the file. Okay, we also need to make this method async because we are awaiting a response in here. Save that. And I'm going to do the good citizen thing and fix that right now. So we'll edit this. Let's go down to 
Uh, the deploy method, deploy, testing the connection, deploying the model, create the model, deploy the model, here it is. And we just need to make this method async. Yeah. Okay, good. I'll walk you through the method so that you can see how it is constructed and how it works. So what we do here is we, oh, okay, another thing that we need to fix here. The first thing that we do is we construct the, the fully qualified file name by getting the, you know, the where we're currently running this app and then the resources folder, folder and then the model file name. 20% of programming is accurately naming your entities. That one's badly named. It's not the model file. It's the model file name. So we're going to go refactor, rename, and we're just going to append onto the escape um, command Z. Yeah. We're just going to append the word name to the end of that. And that is, yeah, oh, model file name. Yeah, that's good. Next. Yep. Rename. Good. Very good. Okay. So we've got a fully qualified file name here. And then what we're going to do is we just await a new deploy command. We add the resource file file name and send it and then we're awaiting it in the service because when we get the response back it comes back as an array of deployment responses of workflows so we grab the first one zero and then we're just going to log out you know we deployed this bpm model get the bpm process id from it and the version that was created in the cloud uh, let me just quickly make that change to the readme file while I remember because it's not the first time I've run into that issue and if you do anything more than twice you should um, what should you do if you do anything more than twice you should automate it uh, 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 okay so um, in here we need to change this one to file name and then I'm gonna go back into my project and update the name in name you know, I, I see a lot of programmers programming, programmers be programming, um, you know, on Stack Overflow and, and various places. And a lot of times people are just like, ah, who cares? What difference does it make? Um, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. It's called technical debt. And technical debt is the enemy of progress. And there's a lot of technical debt that, you know what, you can't control because you just don't know what's going to happen in the future and you write something and it works now. But like, you know, the world drifts later on. But if you're writing code that doesn't accurately describe the world as it is now, wow. Like, yeah. Um, we are already creating enough technical debt with every keystroke that we press that we can't control, that we should be as programmers professionally responsible for the technical debt that we're creating right now. And listen, I get it. If you're an ASP.NET programmer, you know, old school, back in the day, tons of experience with this, you're probably watching some of the stuff I'm doing here and going, that's a crazy way to do it. I get it. If you can do better, definitely do it. Um, I usually program in Node.js and one thing I was really grateful for in creating this demo was the ability to program in .NET and ASP.NET. Okay. Um, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, okay. So now, yeah, we need to get... Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we need to create an endpoint in here. Did we do that? We got status here. We need to create a deployment, a deployment uh, route. Um, oh no, okay, yeah, here's something else that we're going to do. Um, no, we're doing the deployment part, so we're good, we're, we're good. So we just need to, 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 to create the deployment. Um, there's no endpoint. We're going to do it automatically on startup. Okay, so we're going to do this in startup.cs. Let's go into startup.cs. Now, it's in configure. So if we go down to configure here um, let's do it before all this stuff happens right what we do here is we we grab a, a reference to the to the ZB service from the dependency injection container and then we call the deploy method and we pass in the name of the file that we want to deploy and then what we would expect to see after we do the deployment is we would expect to see it log this information out here now I'm not seeing it in here which is not a good sign um, okay we're awaiting, let's try this. Oh, let's just test the connection to see if it's up and running, right? Status. No, 503. Okay, it's actually good that we ran into this, right? Because 80% of programming, copying and pasting code samples, 50% debugging, 20% correctly naming entities, debugging. In your 
come on to cloud account running on like the public beta, it's running on preemptible nodes. So what happens from time to time is they get rescheduled. And then so Kubernetes will just like shut down that broker and move it somewhere else. And what happens when that happens is that it's going to return this 503, which is like not available. So this is a, an intermittent temporary kind of thing. And if I go back to my dashboard here, I may actually see unhealthy for this cluster state. Going back to the dashboard. And there we go. You can see here it says unhealthy. So it's actually being rescheduled on Kubernetes. What would be really cool actually is if it told you that it was rescheduling. Uh -uh. But yeah, the infrastructure um, monitoring for this dashboard is not like aware of that. It's not connected to it. It's just actually looking at the state the same way that I am here where I see that it's unhealthy. So you can actually run replicated clusters in there, but not on the free beta account. And I'm just showing you how to do it with the free account. So it's good that we did this because imagine if you ran into this problem and then we're like, what, what have I done wrong? Going back and like uh, trying to figure out what problem it is. It's not you, it's me. Let's come onto cloud. Happens from time to time. This is what you get on the free tier is this kind of variable available thing. I'm running stuff on the free tier, don't get me wrong. Uh, and so what you really need to do with this is you can code things like um, retries. Uh, with the with the Node.js client, which I'm the author of, I, I uh, made it so that it's like automatically retrying. It's not gonna help you for something like this with a REST request from a client application, but for server side stuff, it just, if it gets a 503, it's just like, hey, temporarily down, bam, let's just retry with a back off. So it's kind of resilient. Uh, still unhealthy. So uh, let's just assume that it worked, right? And move on to the next thing. Actually, what we'll do in the meantime is we'll do this. See, uh, no, we did get, okay, we did get this back here. But only when we ask for the status endpoint. Um, and for some reason, it swallows the exception here. I'm not sure why. Now, if we do a try, and um, so we'll wrap this in a try catch exception block and log the error out. So here we can catch, do I need to catch an exception? I don't know if I do. Um, anyway, what we'll do here is we'll just log the error using logger.log error. Uh, and then, yeah, we do actually need to catch the exception because otherwise we've got nothing to log. So it's an exception, we'll call it E for E, imaginative name, we're going to log error e to string. Very good. Insert that semicolon. If you knew it needed to be there, why didn't you do it? Uh, and then we're just going to throw. So we'll rethrow the error again. Good. .NET watch run is automatically rebuilding. And so during the startup, it's going to try to deploy the model. Ooh, what's it complaining about here? Uh, missing semicolon. If you knew it needed it, why didn't you just put it there? I guess it's like, Programmer's intent, right? Maybe I hadn't finished the statement. Uh, restarting. What would be good actually is if it automatically no, I was going to say automatically insert a semicolon on a on a enter. Okay, good. Now we are seeing the cloud starter services ZB service. Beautiful. We get the error message at the log, so we can see that that's what happened. Um, and here we can check again. Still trying again. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a new client for my replicated cluster so that we can just continue moving. So we'll call this one Cloud Starter. Cloud Starter, like that. Add. And then connection information, copy that. And then we'll put it into the env file, v. We need to get rid of all these exports. And then remember what we need to do now is we need to remove that cloud token to make sure that the OAuth works until that bug gets fixed. Okay, so if I now .NET watch run, Murphy's Law, it's probably that other cluster has probably come back. It has, see, Murphy's Law. As soon as I did that, it had to become healthy again. Crazy. Um, anyway. We are live, and you can see here it's deployed the BPMN model, test process version 3. Now, it'll be version 1 when you do it, but, you know, I've obviously used this cluster to run something like this previously, and so it's deployed um, 
another updated one. Now, every time it runs deploy, if your model hasn't changed, you know, it hashes it and when it deploys it, and when it gets a new deployment request, it'll hash the model in the request. And if it's different from the currently deployed one, it'll deploy the, you know, another version. And if it's the same, it won't deploy another version. So you can call deploy as much as you want. You're not going to get more versions until you actually change the model. Awesome. Now we're going to start an instance of that workflow. So we're going to add fast JSON to the project because a lot of these responses like, um, and metadata, oh, I didn't like that, .NET add package, hey? Yeah. A lot of these responses uh, contain stringified JSON, so we're gonna demarshal that stringified JSON and turn it into uh, like uh, dictionaries and stuff. So let me just fix that now. Technical debt should be addressed immediately so that you don't end up with these massive technical debt sprints, you know? You're gonna end up with technical debt sprints anyway, but you wanna just minimize that as much as possible. Add package. <clears throat> Clean as you go, it's called. It's like being a chef, friend of mine, who is like a killer .NET programmer, and he's a consultant for many years, CTO, and he, um, that's what he's up to now. He said, you know, it's like being a chef, as you cook, you're cutting, and then you clean, and, um, you know, keep the bench clear. Otherwise, the further you go, the more difficult it becomes. Okay, cool. Now you can see here from my status that I've got a replicated cluster with uh, three nodes in it. Yay, the power. This one's the leader. These other two are following. So it's only got one partition, which is replicated. Uh, so that's a high availability cluster rather than like a high performance one. Uh, okay, what were we doing? We're going to create a controller because we're going to create an instance, right? Oh, the fast JSON. Yeah, okay, so we, we, we added fast JSON to the project. Now, yeah, okay, so we're gonna update our interface for the service first. At the top, gonna add in start workflow instance, QRST. Uh, let's make it alphabetical order, hey? V. Doesn't correctly implement it. Let's add the method, we'll go down here. and then copy the method implementation from here. Add the missing references, yay, and save. Cool, start workflow instance. We're gonna await the new create workflow instance command. We'll pass in a BPMN process ID, use the latest version deployed, send it. Uh, and then, yeah, like, this was kind of a ghetto way of getting around this. This thing that comes back, it's, it's a, it's a an object, you know, like a, a class instance with a bunch of properties. So this is how I turned it into a stringifiable um, thing for the controller. So in the controller, we create a new route, which is called start. And then we just call start workflow instance and we return the instance. Which because it's JSON gets automatically stringified by the framework, which is pretty cool. Go back here, restarting, let's make sure it all compiles okay, starts okay, cool. So now if we call our start endpoint, it should return the response and here it is, cool. So workflow key, that's actually the key for the workflow definition. The BPM process ID, test process, version three, workflow instance key, that's the unique key that identifies this workflow instance that we just created. Now, what we can do here is if I go into, we're using my replicated cluster at the moment. You could use ASP net starter. And we'll go and view it and operate. Now operate is the UI for the ZB broker or cluster. And the way it works is that ZB does stuff, it exports records that go into Elasticsearch and then uh, operate reads Elasticsearch and generates a view. Um, I got a lot of uh, instances in here from stuff that I've been doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just delete them all. So can I ask for more than I see on the page? Nope. Cancel. Get rid of all these ones. Inst incidents. Canceling, canceling, canceling. So what this is doing is this is sending a cancel workflow instance command to the ZB broker to cancel these running instances. Yep. Terminating them all. One after the other one running instance now. Here's the instance that we just created. Boom. Beautiful. There it is. There's our model that we created. 
and you can see that it's stopped at the, the get time task. So it's created a job for that get time task. It's waiting for a worker to service that job. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create a worker to service that job. Create a job worker. So in the, okay, this one gets a little bit abstracted. Um, I, I think I've got the right level of abstraction here. So in the ZB service, we're going to create a private method called create worker because we are going to create more than one worker. So I abstracted out this part of it here. Public methods precede private, I guess. Uh, drop it in there like that. We're going to hand in this handle job. Why don't you like that? Oh, okay, we've got to import the missing references, of course. Bam. Save that. Okay, so all this does is it calls the new worker method of the, the ZB client, and then here's like the configuration for it. Uh, you can look into the API documentation to find out more about that. Okay, now we're going to add a public create get time worker method. Um, let's do that. Let's whack it in here randomly. If you're super OCD, you'll make everything like alphabetically ordered, which makes it easier to locate methods when you're scanning through source code. It's one way to do it. And what we do here is we call the create worker method that we just created, and we pass in the job type, get time. Remember, we created that as the task type in the model. And then we have a job handler function that gets called with the um, a reference to a client and also the job, which is the data and the metadata about the job. And what we're going to do this time is we're just going to log that information out so that you can see what it looks like. And then we're going to complete the job. So we use the job key to send a complete command. So we've done the create get time worker. And then we're going to create another public method in here called start workers. Now, I actually could make that method in that case private, but we'll just keep it public, whatever. And then we need to add the start workers method to the interface. Now, I know that I'm violating this principle that I said before about technical debt by not making that private and doing that kind of stuff. I'm just going to keep things rolling here, but you got the idea, right? The main, the basic principle of that is like, and I'm also like registering that that's technical debt. Like I'm aware of what I'm doing, making a choice to create technical debt. Okay. Call this method in the configure method and startup.cs. So, you know, where we do the deployment, we're also going to start the workers. Now we have to do this here because that service doesn't actually get this, there's nowhere else we can do it that doesn't get reactively triggered. Even in the constructor. I put in the constructor. Uh, I could do it in the constructor, actually, because since we're calling deploy, it's going to have to create it. But anyway, do it explicitly. Now, what we expect to see here is we expect to see the worker start and service that job. Bam! There it is. See... The deployment here didn't actually update the model, still version 3, no changes to the hash. The worker got the job, and here is the data that you get with a job. So that gives you an idea of what it looks like. It's like it got a key, a type, you know, the model, that's the, the, the model or the definition key. The process ID, workflow definition version, which is useful for versioning workers. Um, workflow key, unique instance key for the workflow. Uh, the element that it corresponds to in the model, the key, the name of the worker, the deadline. So if I don't respond within this amount of time, it'll get retried by the broker. Oh, look at that. It's 1.23 in the morning. As soon as I saw that, I yawned. Um, and then uh, the variables and the custom headers. And these are currently empty, but th these are strings and they're stringified JSON. Now, if we go, which is why we added that fast JSON to the project, if we go back to the operate, we can see, wow, magic, it's updated. The process is completed because we serviced that task, we completed it, and bam, that's all there was to do. End of story. There you go. We've deployed a model, created an instance, and then created a worker to service a task or jobs of a task type in that model. Next thing that we're going to do, let's next level this thing. We're on a roll here. We're going to add a decision into the model. So we're going to Complica complicate the model a little bit, make it more complex, complexify, mm, complexity, complicated. We don't want to make it complicated, but we're going to make it more complex. So I'm going to drop a decision in here, decision gate. 
Nope, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna save that for a little bit later. I'm gonna delete that for now. What we're gonna do, first of all, before we do that, we're actually gonna get the time. We're gonna get the time. Uh, so we're gonna make a rest call from within the worker and get the time. We're gonna use an API that I created, you're welcome, and host uh, at joshwolf.com. Um, so in our ZB service, in this worker, we're gonna actually get the time over rest. It's a JSON time. So I'm gonna to refer to the correct code sample to copy and paste, 80% of pr pr programming. Um, we're not even gonna do that. I have no idea what I'm doing. Did I mention that at the beginning? What we're gonna do first is we're gonna create and await the outcome of the instance because while we created that workflow instance here, you know, we got back the metadata, the data about the instance that got created, but we have no idea what happened at the end. It ran asynchronously somewhere remotely in the cloud. How do we get the, res the, the, the ultimate outcome? You know, if it's like a, an approval process or something like that, um, how do we know whether it was approved or not approved? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a very simple method that we can use, which is create workflow instance with result. That's what we're going to do first of all. So we're going to the controller to do that. Uh, let's go back to here. So where we have start workflow instance here, um, instead of using just the straight workflow instance command, we're going to add with result to it. Amazing. It's pretty much all we need to do. So under latest, let's go to the implementation of this. Go to implementation. All right, under latest version, we just say with result. Boom. Um, just registering it for technical debt purposes. This is no longer start workflow instance. It's kind of start workflow instance with result or start workflow instance and await result, or run workflow instance even. Okay, let's run another workflow instance. Pay careful attention to what we can see here from the last one. Here's what it looks like with result, bam. And here we have the outcome. And the difference here is that we have variables, the variable payload, which we did not get when we just created the instance, but because we're creating the instance with result, we got the final output of the, of the process, which includes the variables, which is empty because we did nothing. So now we are going to make the rest call from inside the worker. Now there is a bug actually uh, in the worker, which will, will get fixed shortly. But in order to get this, this example here to work, what I needed to do was I needed to go into my worker and where I create the worker, I rounded the time down from, I think it was 30 or 50 seconds. I had to take it down to one second. So the bug is that, that the, um, the worker was basically polling every time interval, asking if there were jobs, and then immediately stopping, closing the connection, and then waiting until the next interval to ask. Whereas when it's doing long polling, it needs to... Is there a long polling actually with long polling? No. Okay, so um, yeah, I had to, sh to crank it down to one, but this should work um, with a higher number in there when we fix the bug. Okay, but let's keep rolling on for now. So next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna make a rest call from inside the worker. So inside the worker here, we're gonna make this rest call here. So I'm just gonna grab that. 80% of programming, copying and pasting the correct code sample. And we're going to put it into the handler function for this get time worker. So I'm just going to drop it in there. Get rid of that. And then we've got the await complete job command inside here. So what we're doing here is we're creating a new HTTP client. And then we're using it to do a get request to this particular API here json-api.joshwolf.com forward slash time, you're welcome. And it just returns a JSON object with the current time in GMT. Pretty simple. Uh, and then we're gonna update the variables here. Okay, what's the problem? Uh, save. Waiting for a file to change before restarting .NET. So it's starting. And then so this time we're gonna hit the endpoint and our process will run and it's gonna grab the time from that API endpoint and it's gonna add it to the variables. Here you can see adding it to the variable payload. Okay, so let us now hit that endpoint. Eh, not that one. 
Uh, this one. Okay. Do the thing. Starts an instance. The worker grabs the uh, job, gets the API response, puts it into the variables, completes the task, and then that ends the workflow. And there's the output. So we now have the time in there. So this gives you an idea of what the variable payload looks like and why we added fast JSON to the project because it's, it's a JSON object, but it's stringified JSON. Okay, next step, we're going to complexify our gateway. We're going to add a gateway to the model. So let's open our model again, and we're going to make a decision in this process. So to do that, I'm going to pull this out to here, and I'm going to drop a decision in gateway in here. This is called an exclusive gateway. So it's a parallel gateway, and from here, we can connect that, and then we'll connect another one. I'm going to drop it in here like this. I think this will work. Yes, very good. Now I'll connect this to end. Okay, so it's going to take one of these two pathways. Let's make it a little bit symmetrical, hey? Mm, drag this to there like that. Nice, nice. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do here is, first of all, let's do the decision and then we'll do the second task. So let me describe the, what we're going to do. We're going to get the time and then we're going to analyze the time. We're going to make a decision based on the time. Is it before or after noon? We're going to take one branch if it's before noon, the other branch if it's after noon. So let's do this decisioning por portion here. So I click on the, the arrow and this is where I put the condition expression. So I'll give it a, a name. So we say before noon. That's one pathway. I'm just going to put that somewhere that looks good, like that. Now, the actual condition itself is written in feel, which is the friendly enough expression language. So it looks like this, equals time, mm -mm, mm -mm, time dot hour is greater than zero, and time dot hour is less than or equal to 11. Or I could do less than 12. That would also do it. There we go. That's the feel expression. And then this one here, which is going to be afternoon. So we could construct a, uh, you know, another feel expression in here, but there's an easier way for us to do this because it's kind of like a case statement and we can have like a default fall through. And to do that, I click on the the arrow where the condition expression would go. I click the little spanner or wrench icon and I choose default flow. So if this condition is not met, it'll take this pathway. So here I'm going to click the spanner wrench on this task, turn it to a service task. I'm going to do the same thing here. Now this one here, I'm going to call make greeting. Uh, no, we'll call this one good morning. That's the name of the task. And then the task type is going to be make dash greeting and this one here is going to be good afternoon good afternoon and the task type is again make greeting now you might notice that I have the same task type here so how do I specialize the behavior of the worker for that task type now one of the ways that you can do that is by putting custom headers onto the task instances so this task here, I'm going to create a header, which is going to say greeting. And the greeting is going to be good morning. Good. And this one here, add the header. The key is greeting. And then in this value, I'm going to say good afternoon. There we go. That should be all that I need to do. I'm going to save that now. Go back to my project. I'm going to have to restart because it doesn't automatically redeploy the models. Uh, it doesn't rebuild, you know, and redeploy models when I update them. So we should see version 4, I think we're up to. Yeah, there we go, version 4. Great. So now uh, what we need to do, well, yeah, now what we need to do is implement the worker. So to implement the worker, Let's go back to the code samples to copy and paste. Here is uh, a larger version of that feel expression if you missed it there. Now, okay, we're gonna use a DTO. Cool, okay, cool. So we're gonna add a couple of custom DTOs, one for the custom headers and one for the variables. 
So we've got an interface here and then let's add these DTOs up here. Save that. We're going to use this to deserialize the, the uh, stringified JSON because both the custom headers and the variables are stringified JSON. Okay, so now we're going to create the method where we create this um, worker. So if I go back up and I find create get time worker, I'll put it underneath this one. Create make, make greeting worker. So the job type is make greeting, which was the task type that we set in the model. And if you look inside here, we just log out that we got the job. And then here's where we demarshaled the, the custom headers and the variables from the job. And we use uh, the fast JSON library, JSON to object, and we it's a parameterized method. Yeah, where we pass in the DTO that we're going to use. And so what we're going to end up with here is we're going to end up with, you know, that DTO populated with the values from here. No kind of error handling or data sanitization on the boundaries here. Just fast and loose. So we grab the greeting out of the header. We grab the name from the variable. So that means that when we create an instance of the workflow, we're going to need to populate the name at the beginning. And then what we do here is we just construct a variable that we add to the payload called say, where we add the greeting and the name. So good morning name, good afternoon name. It's a hello world uh, example. Okay, so next thing we need to do then is uh, make sure we put the name. Oh yeah, okay, we better make sure that we actually call that method and create that worker. So if we go to, I got to start workers method here. So I think in here I don't need to make this uh so create get time worker and create make greeting worker. Yeah, and it doesn't need to be like that. Uh, very good. Okay, yeah, so I was calling those methods in the ZB service constructor. Yep, yep, yep. That's cool. What I did here in between is I, I just uh, refactored them into a start workers method. which I'm calling from startup, I think. Yeah, I'm calling it here from startup. Uh, uh, uh. Start workers, yeah. Okay, so all good. Yeah, okay, I need to update that, that's, that's incorrect. Um, all good, edit the start workflow instance method and pass in a variable name, so Pretty simple to do that. We just add this after latest version. Again, stringified JSON. This is handcrafted stringified JSON. So that's in the controller. Nope. Start workflow instance. Go to implementation. After latest version, I just add that. Add those variables. And then, okay, we're going to do something pretty cool here, actually. So via instance, yep, JSON parameters, show properties. Yeah, okay, cool. Could do the same thing with the DTO. But we're not going to do that for now. Okay, so now what should happen is I start an instance of the workflow. The get time worker, you know, gets the job. It goes out, gets the time from the API, adds it to the variables, pushes that back to the broker, moves to the next stage. That conditional gateway in our model will then analyze the payload and take one of these two branches where it will then... Uh, create a job for the make greeting task and it will have a specific custom header on it to specialize the behavior between the two branches with the same worker. That worker will then construct the greeting, add it into the payload as the variable say, and it will go to the end. So what we should expect to see is given that it is now midnight in uh, where I am in New Zealand, it'll be like 11 a.m., 11 p.m. I don't know what time it is. Let's find out. Okay, so re-hit that start endpoint, doing its thing, thinking about it. Let's have a look here. Make greeting worker completed job. Here we go. Say, good afternoon, Josh Wolf. So the time is uh, 12 in the afternoon. Okay. GMT, of course. Yeah, so it's exactly 12 hours behind. So there you go. The variables have now been populated with a new variable say that says good afternoon Josh Wolf. It's a hello world example executed in Kamunda Cloud using BPMN. Uh, we created a cluster in Kamunda Cloud. We created the client connection credentials to be able to connect to it. We connected to it, got the topology. Uh, we created a model 
deployed that model into the cluster. We created an instance of that model. Um, we then, that workflow definition, we then created a worker for get time. Uh, inside that worker, we got a rest call that updated the variables in the payload. We then made a decision in the model using a parallel exclusive gateway. And then from there, we created another worker that specializes its behavior using custom headers that are set in the model and then updated the payload all the way to the end. And we created an endpoint where we could create and await the outcome of a workflow. So that's, you know, like a good sort of 40 to 60% of, uh, you know, what you need, definitely like 80% of what you need to get started from here. You should be able to go through the documentation, look for some more examples, but this is getting started with Kumunda Cloud and ASP.NET Core 3 and C Sharp.